everybody, welcome and good morning. And what we want to do is we want to start out by saying what we're doing is actually re-recording the sermon from Sunday. Uh, the internet went out in the middle of the service and so uh, those of you that watch on Facebook and YouTube did not get to see the service as we uh, always hope. And so you're seeing me record this in my kitchen uh, where we do a lot of our videos. So uh, what we want to do is we're talking about our fourth message on our New You sermon series, uh, which w what we did was we said if we were to look at 2021 and say what are some skills, what are some uh, different ways of thinking that we need to be able to be successful in 2021, uh, we sat and put four of those together. The first one was, first of all, we needed to define what success was. Success then we defined as being obedient to God. The goal to hear God say one day, well done thy good and faithful servant. Next we talked about, uh, we went from success, uh, we talked about what does it mean to live into joy with the idea that we are called to be joy filled individuals. We are created in the image of God, meant to experience all that life gives us. We went from there to talk about what does it mean to live in the sorrow. And we talked about the God of comfort. The last skill we thought we should address, especially looking at the year we came out of, was stress. I know that many of you live with stress. In fact, many of you have these on right now and you're going, it just the face mask alone causes me a certain amount of anxiety. Well, we said we should learn how to handle stress better. And so one of our goals today is to talk about how do we deal with stress better? How do we manage it? We're not going to ever live stress-free. In fact, I don't know that that's anything that God has intended for us in the sense of life is full of stress. A stress, though, can be a killer, right? I mean, physically, it can kill you. There is uh, all kinds of studies about how stress impacts our autoimmune system, uh, how it impacts our thinking, how it impacts uh, all kinds of parts of our body from our emotional, spiritual, and physical components, and literally can kill you. Uh, stress, high levels of stress have been uh, linked to, to certain cancers, have been linked to certain illnesses, have been linked to, to even dementias. And again, we're just really touching some of that, hey, how does what we deal with over here and what we can't touch in a non-physical impact the physical. And we all have stress, right? Whether it's phone calls that need to be made, sick kids, sick parents, loneliness, job stress, school stress, test stress, kids, homework, stress is stress and it's coming from everywhere and it affects us all, right? And since none of us escape from it, what we need to do is talk about what do we do with it? Now, first of all, we want to talk about the idea that that Jesus, he dealt with stress, right? Think about it. Jesus always had crowds following him. Some of you say, I can't wait to just get home and get away from people. I can imagine Jesus saying, I just need to get away. And often we see that he does, right? But people are literally shoving to get near him. When Jesus has the, the woman that's been bleeding for 12 years touch his garment, he turns and says, who touched me? And Peter's like, Jesus, there are people shoving you everywhere to get near you. What do you mean, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. Jesus knew stress. People were always demanding from Jesus, asking for his attention, asking to be healed. People were crying out, uh, Jesus, son of David, Rabbi, come help us. Rabbi, my son is, is blind. Rabbi, my, my daughter is, is uh, controlled by demons. Rabbi, I have leprosy. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi. You can just hear this at home, right? Mom, 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 dad, 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 right? It's just stress is all around Jesus. And finally, did you know that people actually wanted to kill Jesus? I hope that's not a shocker to you, but we have people conspiring against Jesus to ruin his reputation, to uh, defame him, to change his identity. And there was a group of people that literally not only wanted to kill him, but ultimately succeeded. Now, I live with a certain amount of the first two stresses, but I don't live every day with a group of people trying to kill me, at least not that I know of. I don't think Sarah's paid anybody to do that. And so uh, we, we understand that we have a God who, when he walked this earth, he understood stress and knew what stress meant. Well, that's important for us because then we go, well, how did Jesus handle his stress? 
Well, Jesus handled it by playing hide and seek. Did you know that? God played hide and seek. I love it. In fact, we read often in scripture that early in the morning, Jesus gets up and he goes off and he's praying somewhere by himself. And it's like the disciples wake up, they look around like, oh man, Jesus already left. He's hiding. They got to go find him. You can kind of just see the disciples walking out in kind of the wilderness area. Marco, Marco, Jesus, Jesus, right? We got to find Jesus again. In that, we see that Jesus often handles stress through prayer. Yep, it's the best way to handle stress. Let me give you this warning. It's not a shortcut. It's not a take this cookie, you'll feel better in the morning. It is the discipline of how to live life enabling us to handle stress. There's no other way to do it. There's no uh, shortcuts. There's no quick fixes. This is a discipline that teaches us how to deal with stress. Prayer. In fact, the number one phrase that we see in the scripture to do that is, be still and know that I am God. It's out of Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. This past week, I had a father call me and he said, I, I just need help. I just need help. And I'm like, okay, you need help. What do you need help with? And he said, I just, I, he goes, I, I, I'm so stressed out at work. I'm so stressed because of all the extra stuff because of COVID. And I just, he goes, I'm so tired of COVID. I'm so tired of all the extra stress and the extra hours and the extra pressure. And he goes, I get home from work. And he goes, I, I, I'm not the dad I want to be. I'm, I'm short tempered with my kids and they want me to play, but I, I don't have any energy for them. And he goes, and, and my wife, she's working so hard. And he goes, I, I, I don't have any energy for her. And I'm short-tempered with her. And I'm not, I'm not the husband I want to be. I'm not the dad that I want to be. And he goes, I just, I don't know what to do. And he goes, I just, I need, I need help. He goes, please, can you help me? And my first question was, well, how's your prayer life? My second question was, do you believe God called you to live with this stress? That he wants you to carry all this? Or do you think God has a different plan for your life? You see, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I love the phrase, cast your anxieties upon him. Now, in fairness, it could be cast your worries, your cares, your burdens, because the Greek word there can mean a multiple set of emotions that weigh us down. But I love the idea of cast your anxieties upon him. The point is, is that God never intended for us to carry around stress. Again, I want, you to, I want to be clear. It's not that God doesn't know stress is going to come or that God never intended for us to deal with stress. It's just God gave us ways to deal with stress and therefore he never intended for us to carry it all day. He intended for us to be able to give it to him. Give it to him. Jesus says, come all you who are weary and heavy burdened and you will find rest. He's basically saying, trade your burdens for me. He says, take my yoke upon you. And he's not talking about eggs. He's talking about the yoke that would have been placed on an oxen. And he says, I'll take the heavy yoke that's on you. As somebody's driving you, literally pushing you ahead, forcing you to move ahead, plowing a field that you may not want to plow. I'll take that. And you take my yoke of freedom and grace and joy. Let's switch. What a deal for a trade, right? That's not a used car salesman pitch. That is a, hey, I'll take your old junker and I'll give you this sweet ride, right? All right, so let's take a look at it. Since Jesus prayed, I thought the best thing for us to do would be to look at Psalm 46 and just walk through the prayer. Did you know that Jesus probably prayed for the Psalms? It was a a thing that rabbis did. It's a thing that today you and I do, pastors do. It's a thing that everybody who is a prayer warrior, who has the gift of prayer, they actually pray through the Psalms. Now, it's not the only thing they do, but it is one of the ways that we connect to God. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. And what I want to do is I want to give you the pattern that we see for prayer in the Psalms. Now, it's not the only pattern, but it's one of the most consistent patterns in the Psalms that we see. And so there are four aspects or pieces to this pattern that I want you to watch. First of all, claim who God is. Claim who God is. That's right. Focus on the one true God. 
We see this over and over in the Psalms. God is my fortress. God is my shield. God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my helper. God is my army. God is my warrior. God is my mighty deliverer. The point is, the first thing the Psalms, Psalmists do in the midst of prayer is often they just stop and go, I need to get my focus right. Right? What a great call for all of us when we think about prayer. It's really about stop Focus on the one you're praying to and make sure you've identified that God correctly, which is a big deal in our culture that doesn't want to believe in truth and wants to believe that all gods are the same. Well, they're not. In fact, only one God is the fortress, the refuge, the strength, the helper, the mighty shepherd who comes to rescue and deliver. Second of all, we see that the psalmists are often then expressing their feelings. In fact, one of the reasons why I jokingly say that I love praying through the Psalms is that the psalmists often say things to God that I don't know that I have the courage to say. In fact, in my darkest of times, what I find in the Psalms are words to express what I feel that my soul is so wrapped up, pinned down, burdened down, weighed upon that I couldn't say it. And so express your need for deliverance. God, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. Even if you're angry at him. You can always remind people, if you're angry at God, tell him. He already knows. It's not like you're keeping a secret. In fact, if you don't tell him, you're kind of lying to him. You're trying to hide something. It's okay to be angry with God. Now, God doesn't want you to stay there. He's going to work through that with you. But express your concern. Express your desire. Express it. Now, someone might say to me, Oh, wait a second, Aaron. <laughs> Doesn't God already know what I'm feeling? Doesn't he already know what I'm going through? Doesn't he know everything? Yeah. The express expression of your feelings isn't for God. It's not that God didn't know until you told him. It's really so that, what, you can get it out. This is why we talk to our friends about our problems. This is why we say, hey, you may need to talk to someone. Or why we say to someone, if you need me to hang out, if you need a friend to talk to, I'm there. It's not so that God knows. It's so that we can get it off our chest. Often my kids will be going through a situation and I'll sit down with them. And again, because I've kind of got this bird's eye view, I'm able to know what they're going through. And I know my kids well enough to kind of know what they're thinking. But I'll sit down with them and say, all right, tell me what's going on. Tell me how do you feel. Tell me what you're doing with that. How are you dealing? Here's what you need to know. Again, God invites us to share with them. Because he's a loving God who wants to rescue, to care, to deliver us. Let me give you one more point here. I used this in several conversations this past week. There are situations we go through where, again, we just cry out to God, I'm angry, I'm hurt, it's not right, and I'm kind of mad at you. Which is okay, because you and I have a God that is big enough to have delivered. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes God, as we said last week, walks us through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, he never invites us to pitch a tent and dwell in the valley of shadow of death. And some of us, the valley of the shadow of death that we're walking through is, is a mile. It's, 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 it's a long journey. It's going to take a couple days, weeks, maybe months to get through, but, but we're going through it. We're never to stay and sit and dwell there because God longs for us to experience joy. So what's my image of God when I get there? You see, when we're hurt, we're wounded, Satan wants to attack. Why? Because we're already injured. And there's no better time to attack someone than when they're already hurt, right? If I'm really at war with you, and I know that you're already injured, I'm saying, hey, we've got them now. Let's go get them, right? That's the same way Satan feels. So when you're in that valley of the shadow of death, it is very important that you keep and maintain a correct view of God. Right here is where my image of God is, I come in out of the storm, into the house, and I'm soaking wet, I'm cold, I'm freezing, I'm angry, I didn't want to have to go through this journey anyways. God stands at the door, welcomes me in, and he says, my son, what can I do for you? He may say to you, my daughter, my son, what can I do for you? How are you feeling? I know you're hurt, I know you're wounded. Come tell me about it. God, I'm just, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I, I'm, I'm mad at you. Now, this image may not work for you, but it's mine. It's how I see this working out. 
I see God grabbing a big blanket, wrapping it around us, going and sitting in this big old, big old comfy chair in front of the fireplace and holding us in his lap and saying, tell me all about it. And somewhere in that conversation, as I'm crying, I'm pleading, I'm angry with God. I'm like, it's just not right. I'm just upset. I just see God going, I agree with you. It's not right. I hurt with you. I cry with you. I'm so glad that you've been able to identify. Things are not as they ought to be. And I promise you one day I'm going to set it right. Until then, let me just hold you, my child, and remind you that you are loved. Now, for some of us, just that that picture, that image right there alone, and the reason I have that is because I need that sometimes to just overcome my anxiety and my anger and my frustration. So express your feelings to God. That image leads me into the third point of the Psalms, is that often the psalmist then says, remember what God's done in the past. I'll often recount the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God, and, and, and God did this, and God did this, and remember when God did this, and remember when God did that. And you and I should do the same thing for our lives, right? Remember when God delivered you from that situation. Remember when God walked you through that valley, and that valley, and that valley. You see, what God has done in the past is a pattern of what God's going to do in the future and who he is. The fifth, excuse me, the fourth thing then is claim the peace of God. Claim the peace of God. What we mean by that is you, you've given up. Here's what I need. I've identified who you are. Here's, here's how I'm hurt. I have remembered what you've done in the past. Therefore, I know how you're going to act now. You may not always act the way I want you to, but you are acting. You never, ever, ever ignore our prayers. So now I'm going to let it go. After all, either God's got it or he doesn't. Either God's got it or he doesn't. So to some degree, at the end of the day, we pray the prayer of the Psalms and then we stop and go, and now you either got it or you don't got it. I'm either going to believe you are who you said you are and I'm going to believe that you can handle it or I'm going to keep taking it back. I'm going to give it to you, take it back. Give it to you, take it back. Give it to you, take it back. <laughs> Often that's how many of us do our relationship with God. But God says, just give it to me and then let it go. Then be at peace knowing that I, the God who's got the whole world in his hands. I've got it. All right, now that's the pattern. Claim who God is, express your feelings, remember what God has done, and then claim the peace of God. Let's look at Psalm 46. Before you read it, you may have a little introduction in your psalm. I just want to give you a couple things. The Alamoth, all right, it says, to the leaders of the Korites, according to Amoth, a psalm. The Amoth uh, is a musical term denoting that the psalm was to be sung by the sopranos or the female voices. The Korathites uh, are a portion of the Korathites who are descendants of the son of Korah, who are a branch uh, of sons that are basically are descended from Moses. And we see in 2 Chronicles 20 that, that these are like very gifted musical individuals. And so when we read the psalms, these uh, guys who were gifted as musicians wrote some of them. David wrote some of them. And different individuals are attributed to writing some of the Psalms, including Moses. Uh, and so what we see is, is a collection of prayers from many authors. And Psalm 46 is one of the most beautiful ones. That verse 1 actually inspired uh, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., not, not the guy in the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther, the guy who led the Protestant Reformation, to write the famous song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a strength, a help, a refuge. Let's read it. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Do you see the old hymn in that line? Now, I want to bring out for you the three uh, verbs here. You see refuge, strength, help. God is our refuge. Now, what's a refuge? A refuge is a place that's a shelter. It's a, a, a shield, if you will, that we use to protect when something assails you. If there's a big storm coming, we say, we got to find a refuge. We would be looking for a building to go into, something that's going to protect us from the elements, from the storm. God is our shelter. He is our protection. God is our strength. What's the old uh, children's song say? When we are weak, 
He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. You see, often we don't recognize God's strength until we get to the end and we say, I can't do it anymore. And God goes, oh good, I've been waiting for you to get there. You didn't have the strength to handle it anyways. I wanted to do it for you. I am strong, you are weak, let me take care of this. Finally, God is our help. Now that's awesome. <laughs> I don't know if you're a Beatles fan like I am, although I'm much more of a Neil Diamond and uh, Beach Boys fan, but I love the song by the Beatles, Help! I need somebody help, not just anybody, right? And here's the idea, is I love that because I love that first phrase, I need somebody, not just anybody, I need you, God. Now that's talking about a a female lover from the Beatles, but I love that idea as a prayer song. (laughs) God, I need somebody, not just anybody. It's only you that can come and help me. I need rescued, right? I need someone to help me. Now, I want to pause for a moment because the author here of Psalm 46 has done exactly what we said the pattern was. They've already identified God as our strength, God as our refuge, God as our ever-present help. They've clarified who God is. And in that, I want to pause and make a very important point when we talk about prayer. There is a difference between prayer and meditation. It matters what you focus on. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, because there are all kinds of religions and pseudo-religions out there that uh, talk about this energy and we should focus on this energy or again something that's not even God in fact I talked to a gentleman not too long ago a couple months ago we were sitting in a coffee shop and he said to me uh you know I I like to focus on my energy and and my chi and he goes I just like to he goes I think prayer is about I pause and I just I send out good energy vibes And he goes, and then I get good energy vibes back in. And he goes, that's kind of the way the karma works. He goes, if I just send out enough good energy to the world, I'm going to get good energy back. And he's doing this, and he's doing this. And I'm sitting there watching him, and I'm like, okay. And it's it's kind of Star Wars-ish, and it's it's really kind of an Eastern religion-type concept of Hinduism, Buddhism mix, where if I just think about the energy that I'm sending out, we're all energy, and we're all connected, and I said to him, I go, so let me just pick a hole in your worldview, or maybe it's not a hole for you. I said, but so I say to the mom who's just had a miscarriage and the dad and the mom who are standing in that hospital room or in their living room sobbing, do I say to them, you didn't send out enough good energy and that's why this tragedy happened? Because if you sent out enough good energy, this would have occurred. And he looked at me and he goes, I don't, I don't know that I like saying it that way. And I said, well, that's what you're telling me. You're, saying, you're telling me that, that ultimately your future is handled by you and your ability to send out a good, enough good energy. That the karma will happen. I said, but that's your worldview and I don't want to tell that to the mother. And he goes, well, what's your worldview say? And I said, well, my worldview is a little bit more messy in the sense that it deals with, and I threw a little jab in here, what I call reality. And that is that bad things happen. And whether I'm pondering, thinking, or focused on good things or not, bad things are going to happen. That's what scripture tells us. In fact, often when I'm thinking about good things or focused on good things, bad things will happen. Jesus says, the world is out to get you. I said, so my response to the mother who just lost her baby and the father who's holding her and they're praying and weeping together is, first of all, your baby is in heaven with Jesus. That's going to be a reunion one day. (coughs) That your baby died because we live in a fallen world. And it's nothing you did. Bad things happen because the world is a sinful place. But Jesus promises that he died for you And he died for that baby. And therefore that baby is in heaven and you'll get to see them again. I said, and then I don't invite someone to focus on the energy they send out. But I invite them to focus on the one true God who can make all that happen. Regardless if I've earned it or not. Because grace isn't about karma. It's about knowing who the divine father is. And that's Jesus Christ. 
And I see there's a difference. When I pray, I don't want to just focus on energy. I don't want to focus on just, hey, this is what's going on in my life. I want to focus on God and God alone. There's an old song we sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. By the way, if you're looking for a good version of that, I highly recommend the Newsboys. It's an older version, but I love it. Let's go on. Psalm 46, verse 2. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Now, here's where I wish I could show you the image that we had on the screen, but uh, just walk with me for a second. In Genesis, the scripture talks about the creation of earth, and it talks about this vault in the sky. And it's important that whenever we read scripture, we don't go, it's trying to be a scientific book explaining science. And so we've got to understand that Genesis is about genes and genomes. And, uh, you know, and it's none of that. All right. Genesis and the entire Bible is not a scientific book. We can't ask it to do something it hasn't been created to do. And so often we read stories in Genesis that describe things that, as people understood them. In the ancient days, they understood there was a vault in heaven. And above that vault in the heavens was where the waters stood. And above that waters is where God dwelt. And so when it rained, it was that the, there was a crack in the vault or God had opened the vault to allow the rains to come down. The mountains then are what held the heavens and that vault in place. And so the mountains, you can kind of think about this, right? If you've seen a mountain, you see the sky at the top of the mountain and it goes beyond it. So you can see the ancients going, and see that that mountain's holding that sky up there. So in the top of the mountains, they hold the vault and the sky in place. And at the bottom then, they hold the, the water at bay where it should be. So they're like the pillars, all right, that hold the sky where it should be and the earth where it should be. And so when the author says, hey, the mountains quake, the waters roar, the earth gives way and the mountains fall. It's saying, hey, when the pillars that hold all of life together fall apart and shake, what do we do then? You ever, you ever had that moment in life when everything falls apart? Yeah. I'll never forget when my uh, first wife said, I want a divorce. And I looked and I was like, what? And from there on out, I said to God, everything, everything feels like it's falling apart. Right? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been in the hospital when the doctors say, there's nothing more we can do. Or, I'm afraid you have cancer. Maybe you've been there when you've lost that job and the bills are to be paid and the kids are saying, hey, what are we going to eat? Maybe you've been there when everything falls apart. What do we do? Who do we turn to? What's the response? Well, Psalm 46, verse 4 and 5 continues. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. The psalmist is claiming, hey, though the earth may shake and quake, the heavens will never fail, right? God dwells in somewhere that's bigger and stronger and more important than the earth. And it's, again, it's just inviting us to turn our attention to God. But it's reminding us that the ever-present God is always with us and always able to help. God is with us regardless of what we face. Might be another way to say that verse. God is with us regardless of what we face. Let me say that one more time. God is with us regardless of what we face. There was a mother that called me, uh, and we met, and we're sitting there, and uh, she says to me, she goes, I want to be clear, I, I am lonely. And she's a single mom trying to raise her daughter. And she said, I'm just, she wasn't saying that she's lonely for her husband. She goes, it's just, 
I, I used to have this outlet and I used to have this outlet and she said, since COVID, they don't do this, they don't do this. And my daughter can't go here. And she says, I, I, I'm, I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. And, and she begins to recount for me her schedule. And she says, uh, I work third shift. I get home and I get home just in time to have a, a quick nap or sometimes I don't even get that. I got to wake my daughter up and, and we do online school. And she goes, the problem is, is that I, I'm a teacher all day. I tried to sleep at first, but she, my daughter needs help, and she keeps waking me up. She goes, so I just stay awake, and she goes, I feel like I should be paid a teacher salary right now. And she goes, and I don't know half of what I'm trying to teach her. She goes, so that frustrates me. And she goes, we, we finish up our school, and she goes, I got about an, about two hours there when I can catch some sleep, and then I got to take my daughter over to my mom's, and she watches her as I go to work. And then she goes, I just do that all again. I do it all again. I do it all again. I do it all again. She goes, it's just, it's exhausting she goes i'm just i'm just i'm just i'm just i'm, I'm just and she's kind of melting into the table with her hands on her head i'm just i'm just i'm just and i'm sitting there across from her and i'm like putting my hands on the side of the chair and i'm like i'm feeling the anxiety with you like you're just you're just you're just you're just and i finally said to her i go shh shh i said be still know that God is God. Be still. I said, I want you to know you're never alone. You're never on your own. And things never get too big for God. But right now, I just want you to be still. Find that place where God calls you that's not chaos. That's part of the Genesis story is that God subdues the chaos. You see, the Israelites marched out of Egypt and they they had all these Egyptian gods and, and the creation story from Egypt was this war of chaos and, and would good win and, and even in the Egyptian mythology no one knows if, if good is winning or not it's a daily battle the point of the creation story in Genesis is that God's saying look what you learned in Egypt as slaves isn't true I am a God of order I am a God of peace I am a God who says here are the boundaries I did not create you to live in chaos or disorder you're never on your own. Be still and know that I am God. Verse 6. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. But he lifts up his voice. The earth melts. The Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Again, just hear the anxiety there. The, the falling, the melting, the, the roaring. Uh, which, by the way, is the, uh, the Hebrew word for like a lion roaring, right? And so I love the fact that nations are roaring. They're going to attack. They're going to get you, right? And everything, the earth is melting. You see how the, 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 the mountains have fallen. They're shaking. The, the waters are crushing in. The earth is dissolving away. Again, things are bad, right? Remember, our stability is not found on anything on earth, but in God alone. In God alone. That's why we get to verse 8. Come and see, the author says, what the Lord has done. The desolations he's brought on the earth. Now, this is where the author is reminding you of God's past works, right? He desolated this part. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He, he, he stopped the war there. We won the battle. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear, and he burns the shields with fire. So there's this, look at what God's done, and then there's almost like this apocalyptic end-of-the-world revelation-type message, that, and God's going to do it again. One day it'll all be different. And then I love verse 10. There it is. So be still, he says. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Listen, the author is saying, just relax, pause, be still, and know what? And Be still because you know that I am God. I've got this. I've got this. I've got this. I didn't ask you to carry. I've invited you to live into peace and joy, so you be still and know that I'm God. It's the same message given to Elijah as he's running from uh, Jezebel. It's the same message that Jesus gives to the wind and the disciples on the boat as the waves are crushing in and they wake him up and say, Jesus, don't you even care? Don't you even care? Do you ever say that in the midst of anxiety? The disciples wake up, Jesus, don't you even care if we die? And Jesus gets up and what's he say to the wind? I love it. He says, be still. 
He doesn't need to say, know that I'm God. The wind knows that he's God. So the disciples would have heard that and been like, did he just quote Isaiah or Psalms 46? He just quoted Psalm 46. Be still, he said to the wind. Be still. And the wind obeyed because it knew that he was God. And the wind obeyed because it knew it was God. Then don't miss the power of verse 11. The Almighty God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So again, we have this fortress, this protection image of who God is, right? We, we close with reminding who God is, focusing on God, focus on God. We're not meditating on an energy. We're not meditating on something else. God is the only source, right? But I, I really wrestled all week with, all right, the God of Jacob. Why did that get put in there? Why not the God of Abraham or Isaac or David? Or <clears throat> why the God of Jacob? Well, Jacob is the father of the 12 sons who formed the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there's a lot of times where scripture says the God of Jacob, because he's kind of the, the originator, even though we have father Abraham as well. But the reason I paused here was because I, I thought for a moment, it's calling us to remember that the God of Jacob, God is our father. Right? It's saying trace your ancestry back to God being your father, God being your father. And I love the image because if I remember that God is my father, I, I knew it was gonna be okay. If we were kids and things went bad, as long as dad was with us, it was gonna be okay. We could be lost if dad was with us, we weren't gonna be afraid. We could be in trouble. If dad was with us, I knew he was gonna handle it, right? If dad is with us, so I say to you, remember, the good father, and this is why it's so important for you to have a good image of God in your mind, and honestly, why it's so important for dads to be great dads, because if you're a bad dad, then we actually put an obstacle in front of our children to understanding God, but if we're a good dad, meaning that we care and do our best and love our children, are patient and show grace and all kinds of things like that, we actually enable them to see God in a correct view. And so the psalmist is reminding us that God is a good father. He will take care of you. And as long as dad is with us, it's going to be okay, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear anything. Because why? Because God is with me. Because God is with me. Now pause. Do you see how praying through just this one psalm? can help alleviate anxiety and bring a sense of calm. I'm going crazy, I'm going crazy, I'm going crazy. Who is God? God is my fortress. God is my 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 refuge. God is my ever-present help. He's going to help me. He's going to get me through this. And, and wow, right there in the middle of the psalm, I'm seeing all the chaos and I'm seeing the anxiety and I'm going, okay, yep, that's how I feel. My earth is falling apart. And then I get to verse 10. And so the solution is be still. Take a moment and pray and just, just let God speak to you. This is where we remember that prayer isn't always about us talking. We've got to pause and then just learn to listen to the voice of God. When Elijah's running from Jezebel and he's fleeing because he thinks he's going to be killed, and it's a great story. We don't have time to cover the whole thing here. But God takes him up on a mountain and there's this earthquake and God's not in the earthquake. And then there's this amazing fire and God's not in the fire. And there's this wind that's ripping through the mountain. God's not in the, 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 the wind. And, and then there's a whisper. Why? Because Elijah's so stressed out. He's freaking out. He's got anxiety. And God's saying, look, if you, you need fire, if you need wind, if you need craziness, I can do that. I'm the God who controls all that, but I'm ultimately the God who calls you to sense of peace. And so it's in the whisper. Be still. <sighs> right? Be still. Take a breath and know that I am God. And that's how God invites us to manage anxiety, to be still and know that he is God. Blessings, guys. Next week, we start a new series on relationship grit. Whether you're wondering, how do I do my marriage better or how do I date better or how do I just be a better friend? You don't want to miss this. Three-part series on relationship grit out of Ephesians 5. And why I'm excited about this is Ephesians 5 is one of the most abused passages in all of Scripture. Because people have misread it. We're going to take some time to plow through it and say, hey, how should this be read? Relationship grit starting next week. Have a great day, guys. Bye.